Yeah, so as Josh said, I'm Joe. Um, I'm a software developer at Focusrite. Um, I just wanted to say before I start that I've, I've been to LEDC now probably almost every year since it started. Um, and I always come away feeling really inspired. Um, so it's a real privilege to be actually giving a talk for the first time, albeit from my house. Um, so as Josh said, I've been at Focusrite for eight years now, um, and I've kind of been on my own personal tour of the software stack at Focusrite. So I've worked on products for Focusrite, Novation, and Amplify. Uh, and yes, yeah, some of them have been desktop applications, um, some have been mobile apps, and I've even uh, dipped my toes into uh, embedded firmware. So a little bit about the company, for anyone that doesn't know Focusrite, um, it's a music company and it comprises of four different brands. So there's Focusrite, Focusrite Pro, Novation, and Amplify. So Focusrite, the brand, uh, specializes in audio interfaces um, and they're for kind of home studios and project studios. Focusrite Pro is the more professional branch of Focusrite. So they target their products more towards bigger studios, broadcast, education, just generally bigger facilities. Novation makes MIDI controllers and synthesizers, um, and they're aimed at electronic music makers. And finally, Amplify, where I currently am, based in London, creates uh, iOS and desktop applications that mean that anyone can have access to music making software, wherever they happen to be on their music making journey. So recently joining the Focusrite group are also uh, Martin Audio and Adam. So Martin Audio makes loudspeakers for live sound and installations, uh, and Adam produces studio monitors. So for this talk, I thought it would be interesting to kind of give a bit of insight into what it means to be a software developer at Focusrite. Because if you look at this list, you can see it can mean lots of different things. So in this talk, I'll be your tour guide, and we'll go on a little a journey for a customer using just a few of our products, uh, and we'll explore the software that they come along, come across along the way. So I'm going to dive straight in. So these are the, the products that our customer's going to use. They've got Launchpad, and they've got Launchpad app, and they've got a Scarlet. So we'll dive straight in and looking at Launchpad app. So Launchpad app was released back in 2013, and it was released, it was, it had the intention of exposing the wider population to the ease and the fun of ma making music. You just open the app, you tap some pads, and you're instantly remixing music. And that was the that was the driving force behind the app. And since then, it's been downloaded over 11 million times, um, and it's been featured on the front page of the App Store um, in almost every region in the world. So what do we find when we look inside? Let's dive in. So. Launchpad is a native iOS application, and it uses a combination of different languages. So there's Swift, and there's Objective-C, and there's C++. So the user interface, the bit on the left-hand side, um, that's built using Apple's UIKit framework. So that's mostly in Swift, but there's also some legacy Objective-C in places. Um, on the right, that's our kind of proprietary DSP and sequencing engine, and that's written in C++. And the two of them are glued together with a layer that's in Objective C++ because you can't call the C++ directly from Swift. So writing an app in this way as a native app, it not only ensures that it always feels really natural to the user, but it also means that we can take full advantage of being part of the Apple ecosystem. So when Apple release a new feature or a new device, because we're entirely within that ecosystem, it means there's not usually that much more work needed to support it. So if there's an Apple engineer stood on a giant stage somewhere and they say, all you need to do is rebuild your product and it's going to work, there's actually a chance that that's true for Launchpad. Obviously, it's, there's a much bigger discussion about the benefits and the drawbacks of native and cross-platform apps. And at Amplify, we actually do a bit of both. So we've got three iOS apps and they're all native. Uh, and our desktop offering, which is Amplify Studio, um, uses Juice, so it's therefore cross-platform to Mac and Windows. So let's take a closer look at this audio engine. So although this audio engine was originally de developed for use in Launchpad, um, it's also used by our two other iOS applications, so there's Blocks Wave and Groovebox. 
um, as well as our desktop app, Amplify Studio. So this is the guts of audio processing, DSP, all the real-time sequencing. So it needs to be lock-free. Um, it needs to be non-allocating. So there's a custom memory allocator in there. And it needs to be extremely fast. So it uses kind of compiler intrinsics and that sort of thing to make sure that audio processing is as optimized as it needs to be. So not long after releasing Launchpad app, users started asking for different sounds, different types of sounds to use. So we built a store in Launchpad, and this is what it looked like back then. And we started to build up a collection of professional sound packs that the user could download. Um, this is what the store looks like now. So we wrote that, uh, we wrote a server, and that was in Python in the back end. It was in Python 2, as that was the only thing that Google App Engine supported at the time. Um, the problem was, as the number of users and the number of <clears throat> available sound packs grew, this kind of makeshift store, which was basically a single giant Python file, started to show its cracks, as you might imagine. So in 2016, we started development on what we call the Amplify API, and that powers Launchpad, Blockswave, Groovebox, and Amplify Studio. So let's take a look at the API. So as I said, it started as just basically a single giant Python file, and it's now grown into a series of microservices that manage our content. So a microservice is like a little function or a uh, server that lives in the cloud, and it has a limited set of responsibilities. So the process now is that sound packs are created by our talented sound designers and producers, and they deliver them to us as a custom Ableton Live project. Um, they're then pulled into our system using scripts that are written in Ruby. And then all four apps can display and download the content from these sound packs using a series of endpoints that are provided by these microservices. So we've got different services for different tasks. So we've got some for uh, downloading samples and downloading packs. We've got some for listing packs or listing groups of packs, for example. Um, we've got some for downloading the pack images or previews. Uh, and some for delivering news, for example. We've also got services around user accounts, so um, logging in, logging out, access tokens, that sort of thing, um, making purchases within app purchases and subscriptions, because Amplify Studio is a sub subscription product. So to support this API, we also have a kind of front end, and that's a, a React app. Um, and that means that our content and our marketing departments get to control exactly which sound packs appear in which apps and how they appear and when they appear and that sort of thing. So as you might imagine, this part of the stack uses a variety of different languages, frameworks, and tools. So it's now mostly based on Node and TypeScript. Um, there's also databases in there. So there's Postgres, SQL, and Redis. Um, there's the front end that was, that's written in React. There's scripts that are written in Ruby. There's also a bit of Python still lurking in there. Um, and we also use Terraform. So that's what we use to kind of um, provision all of the servers that are running uh, on AWS. So our users having fun on the, uh, making music um, on the touch screen. It's really immediate. It's really easy. But what if they want the kind of feel of real hardware? So let's say they plug uh, a launch pad into their iPad. So the original launch pad was developed back in 2009, and it was a collaboration with our friends at Ableton. And it's probably fair to say that the launch pad has popularized grid controllers, and it's evolved into lots of different forms, going through lots of different generations. So there's also Launchpad Pro and Launchpad Mini. But what software do you find when you look inside a launchpad? So innovation firmware typically runs on kind of small general purpose embedded chips. So originally these would have been programmed using C or even assembler. And that would have been done by firmware engineers who had an intricate knowledge of the hardware. But as MIDI controllers evolved in complexity and features, the chips became more and more powerful and they needed more and more firmware to support all of those extra features. So the firmware in more recent devices is typically written in C++. And we usually split it into two broad subsystems. 
So there's the application firmware and the platform firmware. So the platform firmware, as the name suggests, it's, it's aware of the platform that it's running on. So depending on the complexity of the device, it might be a bare metal event loop. Um, it might be a real-time operating system, or it might even be a full general purpose operating system like Linux. But the platform firmware, it lives in the real world. So it knows how to write MIDI to a serial port, for example, or it knows how to use pulse width modulation to light up LEDs, um, or it understands how to read and write from flash storage. It knows it has to do that in pages. The application firmware, by contrast, it doesn't know about the platform it's running on. So it's just pure application logic, and it only has a single dependency, which is the hardware, abst hardware abstraction layer, um, which is in between the two. But the, the application knows what to do. So it knows what to do when a user presses a button, and it knows what to do when it receives MIDI, or it knows which LEDs to light up when. It also knows about features on the device. So it knows about modes or songs or patterns or clock or transport, whatever features happen to be on that particular device. So this means that the application firmware can be written by software engineers who are more comfortable with kind of higher level constructs like abstractions or design patterns, and maybe have less of an understanding of the real hardware. Another benefit of this approach is that you can kind of plug the application into different platforms. So here we can see that the same application can run on the real hardware with the platform firmware, or it can be connected to a simulator, or it can be, test, or it can be connected to automated tests that stub out all of the functionality. Um, let's take a closer look at the simulator. Um, so this picture shows Launchpad Pro Simulator. Um, and it's running the same application as the hardware, but rather than talking to the platform firmware, this time it's just running a Juice app, um, which is the simulator. And doing it this way means that the developers can try out the code, they don't have to cross-compile, um, they don't have to deploy it on a real device, uh, and it also means that the development is kind of separated from the hardware development, so it's not tied to factory schedules and that sort of thing, so that's really useful. So some innovation devices have content that can be customized by the user. So it might be synth patches, or it might be MIDI templates or wavetables. So they need extra functionality. So we provide this functionality using components. And that's what you're looking at here. So components is a web application, and it provides uh, an editor, librarian, and firmware upgrade functionality for 13 different innovation product ranges. So the great thing about making it a web application is that the user doesn't have to install anything. They just go to components.novationmusic.com. Um, I think that's how they type. And uh, it will connect to their device using web MIDI. Uh, and it can kind of download patches and send patches all just using MIDI and SysX. And for users that don't want to use a web app, we can also wrap it up using Electron. Uh, and they can use it like a normal desktop application. Um, so our users happy now, they're using real hardware with their Launchpad app. Um, but maybe the time comes when they want to improve the audio quality of their Launchpad. Or maybe they want to record something, maybe a, a instrument or a microphone. So they probably go online and they find out that they need an audio interface. And it's fairly likely that they'll end up with one of our little red boxes. So. Focusrite have been making audio interfaces since the original Sapphire, so that's back in 2005. And since then, the connections have changed. We've gone through Firewire, USB, Thunderbolt, USB-C, um, and the designs have generally improved, but the basic role is still the same. It needs to get audio in and out of your computer and stay out of the way. So the current Scarlet range, it's now in its third generation. And it's used by thousands of musicians, producers, podcasters, and DJs worldwide. But what firmware do we find inside of Scarlet? So the Scarlet firmware is, is slightly different to the Novation firmware. So rather than using a generic chip, they're based around kind of a specialized chip, which is optimized for processing audio. So 
These chips are developed by Exmos and they're really highly parallel and deterministic. And they've got a design, par parallel design that's influenced by the transputers of the, of the 80s. So the Exmos, these Exmos chips are programmed using a mixture of C, C++ and XC, which is, actually, which is a, a domain specific language, which is quite very, really similar to C. So like the Novation firmware, um, there's also a distinction between application logic, which is mostly in C++, and the kind of platform specific low level code, uh, which is mainly using XC because the language supports parallelism and peripherals. Parallelism, that's quite hard. Um, for the smaller scarlets, their main goal is streaming. So they need to get audio between the device and the host computer and back again. And that's that's kind of mostly it. But for the bigger Scarlets, they come with a lot more functionality. So they've got a built-in mixer and a built-in router. Um, so let's take a look at how that works. So you can see in this diagram, there's a router in the middle and that's sending audio to and from the host on the left. So that's for playback and recording. Um, there's a mixer on board as well. Um, a zero latency mixer. So that's, um, you can imagine that like an analog mixer with lots of analog inputs and lots of different aux sends. Um, it also needs to send audio to and from converters. So there's the digital to analog converters and the analog to digital converters. Um, and there's also might be digital connections on there. So I've shown here SPUDIF and ADAP, but it could also be AES or Dante. So to help the user create this kind of custom monitoring and routing environment, we provide them with control software. So here, this person's using Focusrite Control, uh, and that's an application that uses that allows the user to control settings on their device. So that includes setting up custom mixes so that every member of the band can hear themselves with, with no latency. So Focusrite Control is a juice application, but it doesn't actually communicate with the devices directly. There's actually a server in between um, the app and the device, and that communicates, that runs in the background, it communicates with the device. So this is what that looks like. So we've got Focus Our Control, which is the Juice application. We've got the server running in the background, and um, that's just that's a daemon. And then there's the driver. So um, the driver sits down in the kernel level and it shuffles audio and control data between the operating system and the device. Um, some Focusrite devices are class compliant, which means that the driver is provided by the operating system, but for some other devices and some operating systems, we've got to supply the driver. So separating the app into two like this, into um, the kind of client and server, it has some advantages. So it means that other devices on the network can connect to the same server and control devices remotely. So we've got an iOS app, also called Focusrite Control, and that just gives the user a few basic controls that they can control remotely so they don't have to be in front of their computer. And that's written using React Native. Um, there's also RedNet Control, which uses the same server. And that com communicates with our Red and RedNet devices. Um, and it, yeah, it uses the same protocol. So with so many Scarlets coming out of boxes every day, we've got a bit of a challenge. How do we maintain quality and reliability? So wherever possible, we try and do this through automated testing. So we put a lot of time and a lot of development into trying to keep the reliability that our users expect. So as well as automated tests for our code, we also write and maintain a huge suite of automated tests for our, for our hardware. Um, so we've got all kinds of different tools. We've got tools that will generate a matrix of different tests to run on different hardware. Um, we've got tools that can detect glitches in audio streams so that we can run a device for days and days and check that there are no glitches. Um, we've got tools that can measure round trip latency to make sure that the uh, big numbers on, on our website are actually accurate. Um, and we've got tools that mean we can configure devices uh, without needing a user interface. So some of these tools are run during development, like you can see here. Um, but some of them run uh, during manufacturing, so they run on every single device that comes out of the factory. But for all of these tools, even though they're not 
user facing, they contribute a huge amount of value to the overall customer experience. So there we go, our users happy, they've got these three devices. Um, and that takes us to the end of our tour. So we haven't strayed too far from the path of these three device ranges, but we've seen a huge variety of different types of software that's deployed in different ways and used in different ways. Um, and hopefully it all comes together into a seamless user experience that removes barriers to creativity. So there's been a whole bunch of things that I haven't had time to mention. Um, haven't mentioned much about Focusrite Pro um, or Adam or Martin. I haven't mentioned some of the exciting things we're doing by replacing C++ libraries with Rust. Um, I haven't mentioned how we how we use FPGAs to augment the firmware in some devices. Um, and I haven't mentioned the onboarding process so that when you plug in a device for the first time, it guides the users to the right resources. But hopefully, you know, something you can take away from this, maybe if you're just getting started in your own journey for audio development, maybe you're studying or maybe you've just graduated, it's worth bearing in mind that there are lots of different ways that you can be an audio, audio developer. Um, and I would consider all of the different places that I've spoken about, that's all audio development. So maybe at this point you can help us. Um, we're, we're generally always hiring and here are just some of the roles that are open on our web, uh, open at the moment. And there's more available if you go to focusrite.com forward slash careers. Um, and if you don't see something there, but you think you have something you can offer, then it's not gonna do you any harm to submit your CV anyway. So that's it for me. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, just a really quick thank you to uh, James, Paul, Anthony, and Jerome for reviewing this talk in some of its more questionable nascent forms. 